All right, guys, bang, bang. I've got JP here with me. Uh, JP, I thought a great place to start would be we've seen a ton of chaos and uncertainty in uh, this entire industry. And one of the things that you all do is you have a self-custodial platform, meaning that any trading, any features that people want to use is all done from this self-custodial kind of perspective. Talk a little bit as to why did you all make that decision early on and why have you built the entire platform around that specific value proposition of this technology? Yeah, Pom, thanks for having me here today. Uh, Three million people trust Exodus to, to keep their assets secure. And, and we started Exodus back in 2015. And the reason we started Exodus was we were looking at all of the exchanges that had collapsed at this moment in time. Of course, one of the most famous collapses at that moment in time was Mt. Gox. And we thought it was, it was fun to own crypto assets and to even speculate to a degree on some of the crypto assets, but we didn't like holding those crypto assets on an exchange. Because at that moment in time, in 2015, if you wanted to have a diverse portfolio of crypto assets, the only place that you could actually do that was an exchange. So we thought to ourselves, what if we built the platform a software, an application, so that people could download it to their computer or their mobile phone, and then manage their entire portfolio of cryptocurrency directly from with the comfort of their own you know, desktop or mobile phone. And if they want to do any kind of swapping, they can do it from the convenience of all from one interface without actually having to go to a centralized exchange. Talk a little bit as to the details of like, how does a platform like this work where it's self-custodial, but people can still do things with it? Like who's holding the keys? How does that work? What is the platform actually doing? What does some of that architecture look like? Yeah, so in inside of Exodus, as most of your listeners are, already know that since Exodus is a wallet, it's a self-custodial wallet and, and everybody has become familiar with the term, not your keys, not your coins. And this is a, a phrase that, that we live and, and die for to empower our customers to control their wealth. So yes, everybody that uses Exodus holds the keys to their crypto. In other words, Exodus has no access to their crypto. And if a person wants to trade, we have teamed up with a number of, of exchange API providers and, and many of them are decentralized exchanges and, and, and that's how it essentially works. And a person can easily do a, a swap in that manner. And as you start to see these various users coming in, you said 3 million people. I believe that uh, right now you all are seeing a surge in interest, which would be a little shocking to folks who see FTX and some of the other situations that are playing out. Uh, people are asking, hey, is demand going away? Are people leaving the industry? It looks like your data maybe is telling us a different story. Absolutely. So one of the things that's really stood out to us is that last week, on, on Wednesday of last week, over 18,000 accounts were created in, in Exodus. And what, what that means is that somebody downloaded Exodus wallet, but not only did they download an Exodus wallet, they actually deposited money into their Exodus wallet. And previous to this moment in time, back in, let's say, late October, because we're in a bear market, the number of accounts that have been open per day was on the order of about 1,500 or so. So to go from you know, 1,500 to about 18,000 in one day shows that the, that the, the narrative of owning your keys, owning your assets, and because of the FTX collapse is starting to really, I think, become more in vogue for the, the, the crypto population. So. And not to mention, you know, these other lending platforms that have, have collapsed recently. I just think that this is going to be a more important narrative as we go on. And I think even beyond this, and, and we've had these conversations before, that when it comes to trust, trust in centralized institutions, even outside of the crypto industry, people aren't trusting centralized institutions even more. They're trusting them even less. So our thesis is that as time progresses, as years go on, that people are going to seek out more and more, at, more and more services in wallets like Exodus to protect their wealth. When you see um, such chaos, uncertainty in the market, FTX obviously uh, blows up files for bankruptcy. 
What is your take on it? Like, how do you evaluate that situation? Uh, is there any silver lining in a bad situation? Is it all bad? H how are you thinking about this? And, and what are you even telling like maybe your employees as you guys continue to push forward in this bear market? Yeah, so I think kind of rolling back to, to really witnessing how this situation unfolded, when, when I was watching Eric Voorhees, CEO uh, of Shapeshift, Eric Voorhees is our first investor in FTX Alameda. Alameda, you know, FTX's sister company is our largest investor. And so here I am, I'm watching Eric Voorhees and, and SBF, they're having a debate about crypto regulation. And at this moment in time, I was willing to give SBF the benefit of the doubt, given that he has been such a proponent of DeFi in the past. And, and so I think that when I, was, when I was watching this, I was like, wow, this is, this is wild watching this. And then seeing how quickly everything unfolded with the tweets from CZ and then dumping of the FTT tokens, it, it was just wild how fast everything unfolded. But back to uh, internally and how we're talking about it with employees, it, it's all coming together and, and feeling like there's a huge rallying opportunity here to get the message out to the world about how important it is to make self-custody front and center for people. But not only that, not only is it important to get the message out, that's not enough. Just getting the message out is not enough. We actually have to do the hard work to make self-custody easy. Most people, when they download a wallet, they're, they're prompted with this real awkward thing about writing down a 12-word secret phrase. And a 12-word secret phrase for most mainstream consumers, that whole notion feels very foreign. So I think that as a, a, a company or as a self-custodial wallet, as a platform that empowers people to control their wealth and as an industry, we've got to step up and make self-custody easy and safe. When people hear that Alameda was your biggest investor, a bunch of questions are going to pop to mind. One just being, what does filing for bankruptcy and all that stuff have an effect on portfolio companies? My guess, and correct me if I'm wrong, would be that they've already invested the money, and so what happens to them is you know, unfortunate or whatever, but it doesn't really have an effect on portfolio companies. Is that true, or is there other considerations that maybe people should be aware of that portfolio companies uh, of these organizations are going through right now? Yeah, there's, there's multiple considerations here, but, but the first one is, is uh, it's my understanding that a number of portfolio companies had funds stored on FTX. And throughout this chaos, many of these portfolio companies were not able to withdraw their funds. And that's just, that's crazy disappointing to see. Exodus did not have, well, Exodus had a small amount. It was a little over $2 million stored on FTX. We were able to get that $2 million out before this. So the, the collapse of FTX had no material impact upon our operations. Um, but that's that's one of the considerations. Then, in addition to that, for us, with since Alameda is our biggest investor, the shares will be caught up in the bankruptcy proceeding, and so that gives Exodus and potentially other investors an opportunity and go in and, and bid for those those shares. But I I think really when it comes down to company treasuries and project treasuries stored on FTX. That's and knowing that a lot of them lost their money, almost ten billion dollars gone. That's one of the most disappointing and sad things is to see throughout all of this. When you see what people are doing on your platform, uh, what is the biggest asset they hold? Is it Bitcoin or, or is it pretty spread out? Like, how, how do you see what users are doing? What assets they're holding? What are some of the the takeaways right now that uh, that may be surprising or maybe you know would align with what people's expectations would be? Yeah, so we don't we don't see directly what people are holding. We we don't see that, but we can see what people are are swapping. And most people are swapping at least on last week. It was into stable coins because things had collapsed and progressed so so quickly. But when we look at the historical trends, Bitcoin seems to be one of the most dominant players, and that's why I've spoken in the past about opportunities for Bitcoin and Web three. And but but right now, it seems that most people are moving into stable coins to try to 
protect uh, what they would see the volatility in the market, which from my view, um, again, again, not financial advice, but given that Bitcoin continues to fall, and I've seen this story play out before, I've been in the industry for 10 years now, and of course, they say that history doesn't repeat itself identically, but history does rhyme. And so I think that Bitcoin as an asset long term to protect wealth is one of the most important things people can, sit, can consider when protecting their wealth. If somebody said to me, JP, today, here on out, you must only choose one asset to protect your entire wealth across everything, including dollars, and that's the choice for me would be Bitcoin. So when we see the blowups that are happening, there's a bunch of more rumors, there's withdrawals being frozen, there, there's a bunch of stuff going on. And it's somewhat of a fluid situation. So at any point, you know, something could change where we're literally doing this conversation. That's how quickly some yes. of the stuff is moving. <laughs> yes. um, how much of it is a problem with leverage versus centralized platforms, in your opinion? Is it both? Is it either or? How do you evaluate, okay, I got a point at what problems, which one is it? Or is it something else, maybe? I think that the centralized platforms lead to leverage because when when these platforms, they look at their balance sheet and they look at their, I should say not their balance sheet, but when they look at their customer deposits and they see to themselves, wow, we have you know $2 billion in customer deposits here. We can take maybe a slice of this, maybe a billion dollars and we can lend it out and we can earn a yield on that billion dollars, whether it's three, four, five percent, because a lot of traders will come along. I mean, if you look at the initial Alameda offering, they guaranteed 15 percent. Alameda guaranteed 15 percent. And so if, if you're a company with customer funds on your balance sheet, it, it, it can be tempting to make that that jump and say, well, Let's just, you know, from a risk perspective, maybe we have two billion. Let's take a billion and let's loan that out, and then we can start taking some of that interest. Even better, what if we actually offered a product where, you know, a, a lend and earn product where we we tell customers they're going to earn, you know, five six percent on their their crypto, and then we can lend that out to to risky trading. And, and don't get me wrong. I've gotten sucked up into this when, you know, when, when BlockFi came out with their, their Bitcoin product, I was so fascinated by it. I'm like, wow, this is game changing. But one of the things that stood out to me over the years, and especially within the last year or so, is when you would look at the interest rates on these DeFi platforms, the interest rates on these DeFi platforms was closer to 1% to 2%. Those were the real interest rates offered on, on DeFi platforms. So in other words, if you went to a DeFi platform and you lended, you lent your, your Bitcoin or your USDC or whatever, whatever it was, you would get 1% to 2%. And in some cases with Bitcoin, it was even less than that. So then I always ask myself, I'm like, how are these other platforms, how are they lending out at 6 to 8% and some of them promising 10 to 12%? Uh, it's just the ma the math didn't add up, and so I, I can see though how these companies that have their assets how they might think that it's a good idea from a risk management perspective, but that's why it goes back to self custody and the importance of it. And then one final point here that I think is critical is exchanges, these centralized exchanges that have customer deposits on their platform. I know there's this big talk about having proof of reserves. Proof of reserves is not enough. Proof of liabilities, I think, can go a, a, a ways here. But what, what these platforms really need to be doing is they need to, on a regular basis, be publishing their balance sheets, their audited balance sheets, so that people can come along and make sure that their the assets are really intact, and that's something that Exodus does. Exodus has our, our audited financials on the SEC's website that we file every quarter. 
I've always thought it's fascinating that uh, because of some of the decisions you guys have made and how you've raised capital that you do publish your uh, financials uh, publicly. Anyone can go and, and take a look at them. Uh, talk a little bit about that process. Like, are people auditing them before you're posting them publicly? How does that work? And then two is, uh, it's very interesting to hear you say proof of reserves may not be enough. It may need to be proof of reserves and proof of liabilities. How do you envision that working? Yeah, so I, I think I, I, for us at Exodus, yeah, so as far as the auditing process and the gap audits, it, it is it is painful. And especially knowing that we as a company, half of our treasury is in, r- roughly half of our treasury is in Bitcoin. So right now, a person can go to the SEC Edgar website and you can type in Exodus Movement Inc. and you will see all of our audited financials. And, and you can see, and you can go to the balance sheet and you can see, oh, wow, Exodus has Bitcoin in their balance sheet. Exodus has Ethereum on their balance sheet. Exodus has a little bit of Algorand on their, on their balance sheet. So most companies ca- cannot make that claim. But again, I think it's incredibly important for companies to do that. And, and I think that if, you, if a, a company like an exchange uses the, one of the, the big auditing firms, then that can go a long way to actually doing this. Like, so I know in the, in the case of, of Coinbase, uh, Coinbase uses, I think, one of the top four. I think they use Deloitte. I cannot say that for, with certainty. But I think going to, down that route and then publishing those, those balance sheets, again, can go a long way to really at least helping to build more trust in this industry. What is your team saying internally? Are people freaking out? Are they, do they want to quit? They want to go back to finance or, or traditional <laughs> tech? Or is it over? Are they going no, home? Or, uh, or no, are they just saying he, this is the opportunity? You know, see, here's, here's the thing. Our team, so when we started this company in 2015, and, and, I, and I live in Nebraska, okay? And so I knew that, like, look, if we're going to build a, a world-changing tech company, we actually have to think for, as from, from the very beginning of making a, comp- a company that's decentralized, right? And so what does that look like? So the first thing that looks like is that, okay, we're gonna ha- be completely remote. 100% from day one, we're gonna be completely remote. Number two, we're going to pay 100% of our salaries in Bitcoin. And I have yet to date to find another company in this industry that requires 100% of the salaries in Bitcoin. It is not optional. If you want to work at Exodus, you have to get your salaries paid in Bitcoin. And I always thought it was interesting that there were a lot of these companies out there that were extolling the virtues of, of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, and then they would hire people and say, come on in, we're gonna pay you fiat, and not actually live the virtues. Now, I know that some companies offer it as, as optional, and it's my understanding that the companies that do, it's a minimal amount that actually take their salaries in cryptocurrency. So I think uh, for us at Exodus, like offering our salaries and, and making it mandatory means that we only get the most mission-driven people. And then internally, one of the things that I think is, is unique as well that a lot of other companies don't do, and I very rarely heard this, is that we have 100% of our salaries are, are transparent. So anybody in the company can go and look at the spreadsheet and, and see what my salary is and what anybody else's salary is. And again, it all comes down to the ethos of transparency, really living the ethos of Bitcoin of, of having a transparent, immutable ledger and, and making these virtues uh, public and known to the company and, and, and living them. It's, it's incredible, incredibly important. What is keeping you here? What, why are you so convicted that uh, uh, it's not over? That's, that's a great question. This is, this is my life's work. I am going to stay in this industry and I'm going to relentlessly work on this and, and when I say this, I'm going to relentlessly work on solving the problem of making self-custody, making wallets preferable to exchanges. It, to me, when I look at how more customers are on exchanges and I see, you know, Coinbase has, I think, I, I don't, I, maybe 100 million customers. I don't, I don't know exactly what it is, but it's an insane amount of customers. Great. And I know that, that a lot of people have trust for Coinbase and I have no reason to think that they're not trustworthy. 
But when I, when I see this and I see the risks associated with it, that you are giving your money, the control of your money to someone else. And even if that someone else is, is uh, trustworthy, the fact that you're giving control of that up, you don't know how the political climate can change. We saw this happen in Canada with the, the trucker situation, right? The Canadian government went and said, hey, you need to take action. You need to freeze and, 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 and prevent these people from accessing their money. So we believe, and, and I believe that the world will be a much better place if we can, well, if we can eliminate and minimize the use of fiat currency and then actually live the virtues of Satoshi and empower people to control their wealth and make it easy. Remove all of this complicated jargon of 12 word secret phrases. Remove all the complicated addresses. I mean, the fact that if you wanna get somebody in the mainstream into cryptocurrency that's never used cryptocurrency before, and they gotta think about a 12 word secret phrase, they gotta think about security, they gotta think about all the complicated stuff like an addresses, that all needs to go, that all needs to be abstracted so that a person can just download Exodus and just start holding, saving cryptocurrency, and then eventually start spending cryptocurrency and figuring out how cryptocurrency and how Bitcoin can be beneficial for your life. So when you ask me, why am I here? I'm gonna be here in this industry until this problem is solved. Because I think, when, again, when I look at the world and the state of the world, I don't think people are going to trust centralized institutions anymore. And so I'm motivated now more than ever to continue to work to solve these problems. What you're really saying in, in a way is that there's a transition happening between speculation and use case to, to a degree. Is that fair? It, it is fair. And, and I think that one of the biggest use cases, and this is why you know I often talk, a lot of people, when they hear me talk, sometimes they think like, JP, are you actually a Bitcoin maximalist? But yet you have this whole Web3 shit going. I, I am sympathetic towards Bitcoin maximalism, not the toxic form, but in terms of when we think about use cases and we think about long-term store of value, Bitcoin bar none is that best asset. But beyond that, there are, there are I think, opportunities to make Bitcoin and cryptocurrency useful. And so I'm really impressed with some of the initiatives, though, some of the Web3 initiatives on Bitcoin like Sovereign and like what they're doing with the Zero Protocol, allowing people to take loans on their Bitcoin in a DeFi, decentralized style way. I think that that shift is going to continue to happen. And I think that Web3 can help to unlock that. We just got to remove the, 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 the scammy parts and, and separate the scammy parts from the good parts. I mean, there's one other aspect that a lot of people are starting to pay attention to is decentralized exchanges. The fact that you can hold your assets and when you, when you realize like, oh, I'm going to, let's say I have Bitcoin or let's say I have Ethereum and let's say that I want exposure to another asset, then you can use a decentralized exchange without leaving the comfort of your wallet and now without risking your assets on an exchange I think that's important more than ever. So yes, absolutely, this transition is happening from speculation to utility. It's just gonna have to continue to take more and more time. When you think about the next two years, what's your pitch? Like you and I, have, we worked together for quite a while. You guys have been advertisers on various platforms of ours. Uh, you have uh, always been self-custodial. You've always kind of focused on uh, this level of transparency. Uh, when I think of you, I think of a Bitcoiner who is trying to usher in uh, kind of this new future uh, that really allows for people to have control, but also uh, the, the ability to use their assets, how they deem uh, best for them and their family. What, what's your pitch as to uh, why people should check out uh, Exodus, the self-custodial wallet and uh, platform that you've built? Yeah, the world is changing fast. It's, it's happening so quickly, everything before our eyes. So when you look back to the pandemic and how quickly 
the pandemic happened in terms of like, we went from, oh, there's not gonna be any lockdowns to lockdowns in less than two weeks. And you look back to the, the Russian government's invasion into Ukraine and, and, and the American government was saying that the invasion is gonna happen and then it just happened so quickly. And then we look at FTX and the FTX collapse and how fast that happened. It happened in the course of five days, five days. First there was rumors, and then on a Monday, and then by Friday, by Friday, they had filed for bankruptcy. And they, the withdrawals were suspended, I think, on Tuesday or Wednesday. So when people think about the world and how fast things are moving, it's time for people to actually hold their own assets. And that's what Exodus is. Exodus empowers a person to hold their own assets. And if people have any issues, People can reach out to us via our customer support. Our customer support is the best in the industry. We like to, we like to often say that you will get a human response within less than 10 minutes. Now, of course, in turbulent times where the, the traffic just shoots up, we can't necessarily guarantee 10 minutes, but Exodus is that trusted friend that is going to help you on your journey into crypto. And so, a person then no longer has to worry about risking their assets at Coinbase or any of these other exchanges. And again, this message is now more important uh, than ever. Where can we send people to find you on the internet or find more about Exodus? Head on over to Exodus.com and then you can find me at, at, on Twitter at, at JP Richardson. Dude, I always enjoy talking to you. Level-headed, Love. everything's blown up around you. Self-custodial and push forward. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate you very much. And uh, we'll definitely do this again in the future. Likewise. Thanks, Pomp. Appreciate it.